Welcome back to this week's episode of the State of Recruiting. It is a new chapter in the podcast. Uh, as we said goodbye to Nick last week, and uh, we're going to say hello to somebody new this week. Uh, before we do that, I'm Mike Roach, um, and I will be here every week. Uh, and now our new co-host will be here every week if you look to the uh, that way. Uh, Hudson Standish, who's joining us, uh, joined us this week. Uh, very excited to have him on board at the website, um, and, and I think we'll bring something new to the podcast. Hudson, how's it going? It's going great, Mike. I'm pumped. This is uh, pretty crazy, but I'm excited. Yeah, so um, uh, Hudson and I, when we talked about uh, you know bringing him on, uh, one thing I really wanted to do was kind of you know brainstorm new stuff for the podcast, and um, so in the next couple of weeks, I'm kind of going to be giving him a lot of the planning. Uh, to, of the podcast to kind of be more creative with it and uh, take a little more license with it and kind of freshen it up. You know, I, I think it at times had gotten a little stale or something. So uh, excited about that. Before we get into the events of the day, you know, just Hudson, for, for those who don't know you and Hudson joins us from inside Texas where he's uh, worked for the last year uh, covering recruiting. Um, he is a, uh, for me, you know, he's a guy that uh, well, we met last summer doing, you know, doing our jobs and um, became very fast friends, just connected really well. Uh, I think, you know, what's what's most impressive about him is kind of his eye for talent. Um, and, uh, you know, he's a guy that that sees it really early with kids. So, uh, so just kind of tell us a little bit about you and uh, and a little bit about, you know, being uh, your, your thoughts on being at 247 now. Yeah, so I mean, really quickly, just I got started in the recruiting industry in a kind of not traditional way. I originally was just a message board poster and, you know, Texas recruiting consumer. I like to tell, I think I told Mike this on my, our second ever time talking, but I was a massive OG fan of the EJ Holland and Mike No Interviews Please podcast. So being on kind of the fourth iteration of the, you know, No Interviews Please to State of Recruiting, I mean, it's just a pretty surreal feeling. Um, I went to the University of Texas. I then got a kind of traditional finance job. I was looking to get involved in football, whether it was coaching or a player personnel or doing recruiting. Um, you know, really grateful to Eric from Inside Texas for giving me my shot, but this opportunity was kind of too much to pass up, and I'm really excited to get started. And then, and what do you, you know, what kind of plans do you have, I guess, for, or what do you think we can do, I guess, to to freshen up the podcast and make it a little a little different for our, in, in this version of it? Yeah, I think that really a lot of the a lot of the stuff that I enjoy and I think a lot of consumers enjoy is not always following the same format, kind of getting a little bit more opinion based, a little bit more conversational. I, I will say I, uh, one thing and Mike, as a fellow fan of a bunch of different podcasts can kind of, you know, uh, probably relate to this. But I feel like podcast hosts are always like, OK, we need to keep it to, you know, 20 to 20, you know, 30 minutes. And then when you're the one listening to the podcast, you're like, no, I, I have a drive to do. I want this 45 minutes to an hour. Like, yeah. please, please just talk about other stuff. So maybe for those who like a tight 30 minutes, it might extend on a little bit more. But yeah, just a little bit more conversational in nature, a little bit more fun, a little bit more opinion based. Yeah, I think it'll just kind of depend on the week and what we have to talk about. I, I never want to stretch like nothing into 45 minutes, yeah. <laughs> but if we've got a lot to talk about, I don't mind going over and, and hitting that number. The The good thing is, is we don't really have like a, a minimum or maximum where we're, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to Joe Rogan it and do a four hour podcast, exactly. but um, you know, if we've got to go over an hour to, to get everything in and I, you know, during the season, especially when we have guy on to do game picks and things like that it, it runs over it, it runs long so um you know i i think that we're, we're gonna find a groove with it a little bit i it's it's you know kind of something we're we're working on to to make sure we've uh you know make it better for the listeners so uh but so last night texas got a uh last night as we record this this comes out on a uh, friday morning but uh this is a uh, wednesday as we're recording this on tuesday Texas received a commitment from a 2023 defensive lineman and somewhat of a surprise, uh, Dylan Spencer from Houston CE King. 
I, I I'm kicking myself hard because uh, yes, like yesterday morning, I was on the phone with a source who mentioned Spencer to me several times, um, and I just said, yeah, you know, I I know he's visiting in April, and you know, we'll kind of follow back up after that, and uh, just never never got the hit, so. Um, could have, uh, you know, I, I knew things were kind of moving in that direction uh, with Spencer, but, uh, you know, to be frank, he's a guy that we weren't talking a ton about. Nobody in Austin was talking a ton about Dylan Spencer. He, okay, so the kid, I recall when he, Texas was his first offer, and I recall kind of when he popped up. Um, originally at West Orange Stark, moved to uh, Katie Taylor and then to CE King. So he's been to three high schools. Uh, in three years. And so uh, I do believe he will finish at CE King. So I, I, don't, I don't believe we'll see a fourth high school thrown in there. Uh, but, you know, a kid that physically the build is there for what you want in a defensive lineman, especially with an impending move to the SEC. Talking to somebody yesterday, um, I think he's a lot like Jordan Thomas, uh, just from a build wise, skill wise uh, type ability he could kind of play on the edge he can get after the passer but he's going to be a guy that probably plays at 280 285 um and, and just can be a, a big depth body on on the defensive line Hudson what you know what stands out to you when uh when you watch Dylan Spencer yeah I mean I think you're exactly right about his frame and kind of where he's going it's a classic spin down take where you know, maybe he looks like he might be a jack now, or maybe he looks like he might be an edge guy now. But they're going to spin him down, try to keep his hip flexibility and in initial burst. And then, you know, as a potential five tech, wreak, wreak havoc on the inside. On the inside. I mean, Mike, you also talked about the fact that, you know, he's a uh, West Orange start guy. Eventually, you kind of saw that with his uh, commitment tweet too, going the 112% to honor West Orange starts Reggie Garrett. I mean, it, it's crazy because he really has been on the Texas recruiting radar for some time. I mean, you mentioned that Texas was the first to offer him. With, that happened in October of 2020 during the Tom Herman era. Mm -hmm. Like, he has been on the radar forever, but it was just one of those things where as he kind of paid less attention to the recruiting side of things and more and more guys got offered, it just seemed like he – you know, wasn't on people's minds. And, you know, when, <laughs> when you got that call yesterday, I thought to myself, okay, so in my crystal ball and defensive article, I'll make sure to have Spencer in the on deck circle. And he uh, went ahead and pulled the trigger early, which I always think is fun, even though sometimes it can be a little stressful when a guy pops out of nowhere. That's always fun to me when it's like, you know what? I don't need to tease. I don't need to do anything. Let's just get it done. Yeah, I mean, we we obviously – I would love to know everybody who commits before they commit to have the story written, uh, all those sorts of things. But, um, you know, we're just not going to every time. It's just the case of it, it happens. So, um, like I said, I, I wish I had gotten the hint better. Um, I wish I had uh, kind of understood what the source was telling me. Uh, but, you know, in the end, I think it was a fun surprise for the fans. Um and I think, you know, we, I wrote about this on, on Horns 24-7, but um, it changes the math a little bit, I think, on the defensive line because if you look at it almost like an election, right, like when you're looking at electoral math and it's like, oh, this guy won a state he wasn't supposed to um, and you weren't factoring it in or he lost a state he wasn't supposed to, I think winning a guy that not many people were talking about at a position like that kind of changes your math in your head. You know, guys like Avian Carter and, and Ashton Porter, I think are, are similar fits defensively. You know, what do what happens now with them? Um, are, are they kind of pushed into moving that timeline up if they want to get on board? Um, you know, so it's, it's interesting because it, it kind of throws off where it's, I guess a more apt comparison would be, you know, kind of at the draft at the top end of the draft, when somebody takes somebody, nobody yeah. expects and guys start moving around for that. And another thing too, Mike, is you kind of saw it with the um, you kind of saw it with the staff last cycle with offensive linemen. You know, if they view Dylan Spencer as a take right now, that means they really like him. And if somebody else that they like, like Ashton Porter or you know Avion Carter, hops in the mix, I don't get the sense that that's necessary. Even with a smaller class, I don't get the sense that that's necessarily going to discourage them from recruiting Colton Vosick or a lot of these other prospects that 
they really covet and value highly. Like, you know, Colton Vosick has offers from Alabama, Clemson, basically everybody now. Like, they're not going to just drop him. They're going to take as many elite players in their mind as they can, regardless of how the positional fit kind of works out. Yeah, for sure. But I mean, you know, there is a there is a sort of there is a cap at some point. I mean, you can only take so much, especially with the numbers they took last year. Um, I think uh, so. There is somebody brought it up on the board. There's a ranking disparity there. I mean, he's a he's a four star on the composite. He's a three star for twenty four seven. Um, kind of a big bump in the rankings, uh, or I'm sorry, a big gap in, in each ranking. Um, Hudson, what's your personal opinion? You know, do you think I personally to me after seeing his film and I know his saw his sophomore stuff wasn't as good, which could have caused his drop. I think his junior stuff was, was better. As we said, uh, to me, he's probably kind of somewhere right in between that composite ranking and the 24 seven ranking. Yeah, I, I had him lo- – what did you think? I kind of loosely had him as like a 90 or a 91 just in my own head. Did that kind of – Yeah, and I probably had him as like an 89 or a 90. Gotcha. So, you know, um, both both are close there. I, I kind of think, too, that when I watched him live for CE King, I want to say against Shadow Creek and another playoff opponent – he looked really good. So I kind of think it might even be one of those things where I liked his overall CE King game tape a lot more than I liked his stuff at Katie Taylor. I was a little bit worried about him when I saw the Katie Taylor game tape. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to lie during the sophomore year, but he looked better at CE King. And I think that this is going to be one of those ones to where his senior year, having the consistency of just staying at the same school and, you know, being familiar with the scheme. I think that his senior year was CE King with a rising good CE King program. Like he's going to, he's going to feast and, you know, it, he may, might be able to play his way into a, you know, better ranking with two, four, seven. And of course we've got to give all love to Bo Davis for this one. Bo, Bo's got his guys. And I was told yesterday, like, look, man, when Bo wants a guy, we just get out of the way and let Bo have the guy. Um, and uh, Bo wanted the guy, you know, he, he this was a, a Bo Davis move. Uh, that's, that's, you know, this uh, it kind of lines up with what, what he did with, you know, Chris Ross last year and just said, Hey, get out of the way. I'm going to take this one. And um, I think this is, this is, so this is our 2023 Chris Ross. Um, all right, let's move on to our next segment. Uh, Hudson Hudson really started Monday was his official start date, but he really got got his feet wet Sunday at the Under Armour camp in Dallas. Uh, we were able to see a ton of the best prospects from Dallas and Houston. Uh, let's just start with you know who were a couple of guys that stood out to you. Yeah, a little sleeper. I don't know if people have heard of him called JV and Tobiano. Um, he's a he's he's a nice player, but in all seriousness, Tobiano, I think really made a um, really made a case for the best player in attendance on Sunday. He looked a lot bigger than his six foot 180 listing. He was fluid in coverage. I mean, I, I I've seen him play actual football before, so I shouldn't be so shocked that, you know, he looked as good as he did, but it's just, a you know, sometimes you don't see a kid for three or four months and, you know, that was the reminder like, Oh yeah, this guy's a top five player in the state easily. He was great. Um, off the top of my head, I mean, Jonte always looks really good in the camp settings because he's able to put his technical route running prowess on display. He looks good. Malik Muhammad from Sock looked really good. He was even taking some reps at wide receiver and was showing off the elite body control and, you know, ball skills. Like, that was really impressive. Um, offensive line-wise, I thought Jaden Chapman had a really good day. Um, mm-hmm. A little surprising that he didn't get honored with, uh, you know, MVP honors for his group or a Under Armour All American game invite, but <clears throat> the Harker Heights lineman looked really impressive. And then somebody else that I was kind of thinking had a nice day was probably um, Trey Wisner. I thought that he did a really good job catching the ball out of the backfield. He's a really good basketball player, so seeing him kind of translate that athleticism into, you know catching passes wasn't really surprising, but it was, it was nice. What about you, Mike? Uh, so there were a couple of guys that, uh, again, and I agree with a lot of years, love Jaden Chapman, thought he was really good. Uh, David Hicks was, I mean, strong as always. He's just so, 
man, his hands are just so good. Like when he, when, when you hear him hitting pads or even hitting a, a guy in like a one-on-one situation, it sounds like Mike Tyson, like punching pads. Like it, it, it does like his one, two is so quick and it's so violent. How many times do we see him where, Guys would get in front of him and seem to have him blocked, and he would throw like a straight arm and just knock them off their their base. I mean, three hundred and fifty pound guys, and he's just throwing them around with with one hand. His he's that's like my favorite thing about him. I think there's so much development there. Yeah, and in Mike, you obviously know this, but a lot of listeners won't. Like there there are rules where there there are no bull rushing at these mm-hmm. at these camps, but. I think sometimes coaches literally get confused because he's just extending his arm to create leverage and people fall down. So they're like, no bull rushing DJ. And he's like, right. I'm not bull rushing. I'm just strong. Yeah. Yeah. He's so, uh, he generates so much power and he's so good with his hands. It's uh it was impressive to watch. Uh, Jordan Renat, I thought was, was kind of dominant. Um, as good as DJ Hicks was, I thought Jordan Renat had a, a, an argument to be the best lineman there. Um, you know, he put on kind of a display and I, there's been a lot of up and down opinions about Renat. I was listening to other guys in the media, you know, talk about how they didn't think he was as good or on this tier. And I'm like, I don't see it, man. Every time I've seen that kid, he's been incredibly impressive from a physical standpoint. So uh, I thought he was really good. Um, you know, a guy we, we both really liked and we talked about, could have been the overall camp MVP as a 2025 DeCorian Moore from yeah. uh, from Duncanville, who we've talked about a lot on this podcast. I've, I've known that kid since he was in eighth grade. Last year, I watched him just kill college kids at the S or uh, I'm sorry, se- uh, high school seniors at the SMU camp uh, as an eighth grader just showed up and, and did kind of what he did at Under Armour. Uh, I mean, it, it's pretty clear to me DeCorian Moore is probably going to be in the argument to be wide receiver one in the 2025 class. I know it's a long way off, but what he was doing was it wasn't like, oh, that's really good for a freshman. It was like, oh, he's maybe the best receiver here. Yeah, I tried to get that across in a couple different. I think I've written about DeCorian Moore twice since the camp. And you don't want to get to the point to where you're just keeping so much praise on a freshman that it gets to their head. But DeCorian's not that type of kid. Like, yeah. he, he's not going to deviate from his process because people are writing about him. And I don't get the sense that he's even done scratching the surface of his ceiling either. But that's just how high of a floor he already has as a freshman in high school. After, again, starting at wide receiver for Duncanville, like, mm-hmm. school that produces the most D1 talent football players. He started as a freshman, was putting up numbers. And again, with all this blue chip talent on display, you know, was borderline dominant. Yeah, absolutely. I thought, um, you know, he was, for me, among the guys people would know, probably the best receiver I saw out there. I thought Jonte was really good, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, Braylon James had a strong day, and he was a guy that, like, Physically, you know, when you, you you don't remember like last time you saw Braylon James and then you see him physically, just the length and the build and all that, you know, he just looks like a Greek god out there. Um, you know, a couple of names, and, and I'd love for you to throw a couple out too that weren't on the radar, weren't guys Texas fans really know or, or guys we've even really covered that have been, you know, really taking over these uh, camps. Ricky, uh, not Ricky, sorry, Ernest Thomas uh, from North Forney, has been dominant in the two camps we've seen him in in the last couple of weeks at the Next Level Athlete Camp uh, and then again at Under Armour. I looked up and there there he is, Ernest Thomas, just snatching bodies. Um, I thought he was was really impressive. Uh, our guy, uh, Naredo Stoker from South Oak Cliff, Big Mike, um, kind of his first big camp experience. I thought he, he more than kind of held his own. Uh, at offensive line, I think he's really in for a, a big year, and, and I, I'd be really happy for him. I've been, uh, you know, trying to pump that kid up since last spring. So um, I think the season was really important for him, and then he kind of came through. Uh, and then we saw a tight end. I'll let you go a little more into him, Joseph Moreland, who every time we looked up, we just kept going, who is that kid? You looked at your roster, I'm like, oh, it's a Moreland kid again. He's just getting open and catching everything. So uh, I, I those camps are always great because of a kid like that who comes from out of nowhere and makes an impression. Yeah, just two quick hitters on two names that you had. 
One, Narrative Stoker, Big Mike, it's not even just that he had a good camp. It's that he had a good camp where his reps were against Zena Amozolo, who, you know, people should know as, you know, a composite five-star in the 24 class, and Brad Spence, who is such a different body type than you're used to competing against, because Brad Spence uh, has a Texas offer. Texas kind of views him as an inside linebacker, but he competes on the camp circuit as an edge at like 6'1", 215. So he's just a pure speed, you know, he's just a pure speed rusher. And Big Mike was able to hold his own. He has the size and has put on display really good, you know, camp performances. So by the time that all these power five and group of five coaches get his measurables, it, it'll just be inevitable that it'll blow up. And like you said, Mike, he's one that you've, you know, been telling me about for the longest time. Um, and then on Joseph Moreland from Austin St. Michael's, that was the true, I'm really excited just to see how many offers this kid picks up after this camp. I mean, during one-on-ones, it was shocking how many times he would beat highly regarded defensive backs. As a tight end, he's not a receiver, so he kind of is at a little bit of a disadvantage. And just the ability that he had to extend his catch radius and pluck the ball out of the air, he's going to he's gonna end up as a Division One football player. He, he's told me after the camp that he was hearing some from Rice, but that was about it. He's already picked up one offer since, and I think that he's going to – He's just going to explode. One more kind of that I don't think a lot of Texas fans will know about, but you and I definitely know about 2025 Keller Central QB Keldon Ryan was amazing. He was my second favorite quarterback on the day behind uh, Baton Rouge, Woodlawn, QB, and Purdue commit um, Ricky Collins. Keldon Ryan was amazing. He was such a, such a good player. And especially on – I used to play quarterback with windy conditions. It always gets in your head a little bit, especially if you're not totally confident in your arm that day. He was just cutting through the wind easily. He he was awesome. Yeah, and it was windy. Um, the the wind burn on my face and lips. To, yeah, there you guys see yours too. Um, all right, so that was Under Armour. Uh, we did a full oh, um, Mike, real quick too. Just I, I sorry to cut you off. We probably should mention Tayshawn Wilson too, just because he tested yeah, all the parts absolutely. And, and looked really good in one on ones too. So, just real yeah. quick, do you have anything quickly on Tayshawn? From what we were told, tested extremely well. Um, that's a kid, man, that we've talked we talked a little bit about here in the past. Nick was a big fan of his. I I think you know you look at him and he's a you know five eight five nine kid at DB, but runs extremely well. Just had a ten six hundred. Um, in track and you know when you see him in these camp settings he's kind of taken them over he he plays so much bigger um if you look at him like almost like a deuce Harmon uh type of guy who deuce was a a five nine corner but he played so physically and ran so well like it just didn't end up mattering i think he's that or he's you know there's a little bit of quandre digs in there that he doesn't know he's five eight five nine he's kind of like uh, where are you at, boy? He's kind of like my buddy Winnie, my my dog, uh, who's a little terrier, but he thinks he's a German Shepherd. You know, he's he he doesn't let the size thing affect him, and I think that um, I think that that's uh, the most impressive thing about him. I love the shades of Quandre Diggs comp because you can see it at times, and you don't want to give the all pro comp to somebody straight up. So that's why you'd see the he's kind of like or he shades like Quandre Diggs. But that's really who, who he reminds me of. I mean, I think that if he was at a little bit of a bigger, you know, high school football program, he'd be able to make more of a productive impact and people would covet him a lot more as a prospect because he's just awesome every time we see him. Mm -hmm. Great kid, too. So we had a lot of evaluations. Uh, Hudson did a lot of the evaluation stuff from Under Armour. I wrote up a lot of recruiting stuff from it, uh, news notes. We've got a full list of visitors coming up. So a lot of stuff going on over at Hornish 24-7. Please go check it out. Um, all right. Before we get out of here, we got to talk a little. It is This is Arch. You know what I mean? Are we going to – I'm trying to think of, of March Madness puns we can turn into Arch. March Madness. So, yeah, so it's Arch Madness. This is Arch. Um, well, I don't know what other things go along with March Madness we could convert into that, but um, we are getting all sorts of Arch Madness. I think the internet has started to go a little bit crazy 
um, with the with his upcoming visits. And you know, it is something. You know, frankly, with with him coming to Texas in, on March twenty sixth, we talked about a source telling us, you know, there's a chance he could return the next week. We don't we don't know that for sure. Um, I think people got a little bit ahead of themselves and thought, okay, he's going to shut it down. And they start putting pieces together here, here, here. Some crystal balls went in nationally. I think that there's been a lot of national buzz on, on this. Um, personally, from what I've been able to ascertain from talking to people, I just don't think anybody should expect a commitment this early. Um, now I'm prepared to be wrong. And I think if I'm wrong, not many people are going to mind if I'm wrong and he commits uh, next week. But I, I just uh, – talking to people, they, they don't seem to think he's near a decision before making another round of visits. They think he's a summer decision. So I would caution people of, you know, getting too wrapped up in this buzz and, and going too hard on it. Yeah, I, I'm with you lockstep. Also, I don't know. It's one of those ones where people have great sources – around arch but the family's just going to set it up to where they're going to be the ones to know and they're mm -hmm. i mean i'm curious to hear what you think i think they're probably going to release it through a big time national source too like a i wouldn't even be surprised if a rapaport Schefter, pete thamel are the ones to break this story like I, I don't get the sense that this is a traditional recruitment too when you talk about the decision timeline we do think it's going to probably be in the summer but it's also one of those things where the traditional ways that we find information, I don't think will be there for Arch. Like Arch isn't going to hit up a, you know, edit dude. Like he's not going to need a graphic or a video. So you're not going to get the intel that way. It's going to be handled almost like free agency. Yeah, I did get a giggle in my head thinking about like a video with Arch with like, um, you know, some sort of lady playing in the background. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't think of who it would be, but like, yeah, that and him like in like a sick mixtape of him like, <laughs> you know, spin moving kids. Um, yeah, that's just not going to happen. I think it's you know it's possible. Yeah, you're right. I think it could go through a big national source, but I also think that the family has really operated with, uh, especially guys at our level like Steve Wilfong. Um, I think it's possible yeah. it could come through us and, and Steve Wilfong. You know, I think Absolutely. that or, or a small group of guys from all the all the networks who have built that trust with the family. So, yeah, you're right. It's not going to be, you know, don't put your notifications on for ours. It's not going to be something like that. Um, and uh, because of that, I think that, you know, regardless of where he goes, it's going to be a terror dome for whoever's covering it because it's like, oh, this could drop at any minute and I could be doing whatever. And the biggest news, you know, we could possibly have not have a story ready for it. So, um, there's a little peek inside my mind. Um, but yeah, I think really people read a lot into it. You know, Hudson came over and put in a crystal ball for Ruben Owen. Steve Wolfong recently put in a crystal ball for Ruben Owen. So that got like the mental math of, well, these guys are putting crystal balls in for Ruben and he's tight with Arch. So that must mean Arch is committing. And it's really just, you know, I think people are, are coming around on what, I've always felt, and, and Nick and I have always felt, is that Texas was never really out of it when Ruben decommitted. Hudson did it because he's new over here. He wanted to put in some, you know, carry over some crystal balls. But I, it's, you know, a lot of that stuff has nothing to do with with what we think of, is going on with Arch. Yeah, absolutely. And also, it, it is kind of funny, too, just some of the people in the industry who downplayed Texas at being a factor with Arch now suddenly kind of, you know, the buzz getting to them and kind of altering their, you know, opinions and mental math. That's kind of funny to watch. No, the Ruben thing had nothing to do with Arch. I've told people at my previous stop at Inside Texas and here at 247, I'm not going to make an Arch crystal ball pick or prediction unless it's 100% known. And even then, I probably won't even make one because, you know, that's one to where if I don't personally – if I'm not personally getting intel, I'm just not going to make a pick. Like it, it's fake and kind of weird to act like you're an authority on the pick when you're not even, you know, getting some scoop. So right. no, it, it's not gonna, that's not going to happen. And yeah, I, well, I don't know. That's, I mean, that's just my thoughts on it. I mean, it's not, you can get information many other ways. Right. But sure. it is weird to me that like, 
like for people who have never met the kid or talked to it or mm -hmm. you know putting the like for for me like somebody coming out of nowhere and just be like well you know nobody's oh, that's weird yeah it's super weird and i think that you know if you're in the kid's shoes you probably in you know arch doesn't do a ton of social media but he for sure sees all that stuff i think if you're in the kid's shoes you're probably like okay who is this guy i've never met and what does he yeah. think he knows about the situation so um you know it is what it is i've kind of been on the record of I'm not, if you see a crystal ball from me, start celebrating because the only way I'm putting one in is if I know, um, you know, pretty, pretty for sure that it's yeah. going to happen. I think that, um, I think that to, I've told people the, the article I least want to write is I'm changing my crystal ball from Texas to blank. Uh, for Arch Manning, like the the meltdown that would ensue, I would rather him just commit and me not have a pick in. Um, I the, said the same exact thing. Yeah, yeah, I'm fine with that. I'm fine with with not having a pick if that's the case. So um, a little Arch Madness to get us started, with, and it'll really ramp up, you know, in the next two weeks when he's there. So we'll see kind of yeah. how that shakes out. And real quick, Mike, too. One thing on Arch, I don't that I don't want to get lost on fans too is that. It is Arch Man it is Arch Manning visiting Texas, and that's big news at all. But the almost like ripple effect that it has throughout Texas recruiting on other guys just wanting to kind of um piggyback off the arch. But like there were so many kids at Under Armour where it was like, when are you visiting Texas? Well, whenever Arch is there. Mm -hmm. I'm there yeah. the Arch weekend. I, I don't know if it's March 26th in my mind, but I know it's when Arch is there, so that's when I'm going. Right. Yeah, there is a lot of that. I mean, there's a ton of it, and uh, we see it a lot, and that's why he is a pivotal recruit, not only from a talent standpoint, but from a what he could potentially bring to this class. And, you know, we saw it with Quinn early on when he originally committed. A lot of kids started – the buzz picks up. You know, it's like, I want to play with that guy. I want to play with this guy. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's funny because, like we said, Arch is – and from what I understand – for the kids that know him well, the Jonte Cooks, the Ruben Owens, he's a – they love him. You know, he's he's probably really easy to talk to. Um, I've kind of – this is going to sound incredibly creepy, and I don't mean it to. I've observed him from afar a lot, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I've, I've watched him at practices. I've watched him during his games. I spent – last year I was at the Oklahoma State game shooting pictures, and I kind of was just watching the recruit section. And he interacts well with everybody. I'm sure, like – you know, he's not to them. He's not really, Oh, that's, that's Arch Manning. He's just our buddy Arch. But um, it's just funny that like, he's not this public, really public person. And like people are going to fall all over themselves to, to be in a class with him. Exactly. All right. Uh, I think that's it. We're going to have some more stuff in the coming weeks, some fun segments to talk about some things to do, but we, we wanted to hit the, this one hit the ground running and, and uh, kind of get it started. Uh, so Hudson, appreciate it. Thank you for logging the first of many, hopefully, in the books and uh, and going forward. Anything you want to add before we get out of here? Um, shout out to Charles Daniels. Charles, that's a name. Yeah, we might have to get a mailbag together pretty soon um, and and do a mailbag episode. It's going to depend on I me. Mean, we've got some really busy weekends coming up, so we're going to have a lot to talk about. Absolutely. Uh, we appreciate you guys for listening. We appreciate everybody for their interaction with the show, for playing along. Uh, and we appreciate Taylor Estes for uh, getting this thing together and uh, not do it, and not making me do all the editing and, and all those sorts of things I used to have to do. Uh, for Hudson Standish, I'm Mike Roach. We'll see you guys next week.